I'm going to talk about my, my internship project, basically, and just kind of other work that I've been doing at Facebook. Uh, and the, he, he mentioned that I, I wrote this kind of ODBC driver for, for something called Presto, which is a, a SQL interface to Hive, uh, and the, the same sort of storage that that uses on petabyte scale, basically. Um, and if those words make sense to you, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're, that's kind of what we're dealing with today. And it, it's kind of an awful task, really. It, the, the Presto team said, we need an ODBC driver. Everyone's been requesting one of these. Uh, but it's such an awful thing to write, and I'll, I'll talk about why. And so they basically slapped on some bells and whistles and said, hey, we'll get someone. We'll just tell them they can write it in D, because that's new and popular and cool, and that's what all the people want to be doing. Um, and it worked. So I ended up doing that. And it turns out that D actually just made the task a whole lot easier. It wasn't just a way to, to hook someone in, but it, it really uh, let me wrap a lot of things and abstractions that were safer and, and made the task much nicer to deal with. So the talk today is kind of an experience report of doing that. It's, uh, this was my first production decode. It was also close to my first actual decode at all. So I'm not really a D expert, uh, which in some ways gives me an interesting perspective. Um, and in fact, a lot of the code here, if, uh, if you look at the actual open sourced version, you will find that it is slightly different because I've decided that it need work, needed work. So smelly task. Uh, number one, there's this thing ODBC, Open Database Connectivity. It's a standard published by Microsoft back in the 90s. Um, the documentation is kind of awful. You don't know if you're working with narrow strings, with wide strings. Uh, the, there's stuff that's consistent in 95% of the functions, but not for another 5% of the functions. And so this whole time you're kind of dealing with, am I shooting myself in the foot? And C doesn't really add to that. Uh, in, a, in a kind way, it just kind of makes everything more lovely. Um, and you're dealing with the corners of support for, for D in general, right? So we're talking Windows 64 a bit, which is already kind of sketchy. Um, and then I'll talk about actually that there was part of Phobos that I don't even think compiled on this platform. Uh, it uses an odd linker as well. Uh, and then there's DLLs, which just barely worked well enough to get this to happen. So all kinds of things make this a very fun thing to do. I wanted to show one of the functions that I had to actually implement. Um, and this is the, the C version. And I wanted to just kind of take a moment. What, when you look at this, makes you nervous? Right? Forget having ideas on how to fix it, but what, what's unsettling about this particular function? <laughs> <laughs> Literally everything. OK. Um, do we, do we want to break that down into, some, yes? The commas? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm confused by that answer. <laughs> oh, it, sorry. It, it's a function. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, this is the, the font size for everything. So. Void star. I like it. So, the, or rather, I hate it. Anything else? Uh, pointers are arguments. Yeah. Pointers are arguments, okay. Why is there a length that's a, that's a pointer? A length that's a pointer. Um, so that is for telling the C code how many bytes I actually wrote into the buffer. So it's an out parameter. Yes, it, it is an output parameter. Okay. And there's a void star there. Yes, that was, that was mentioned, but it's one of the things I dislike. Um, so I've got a few other things on here. Uh, I hate the fact that the length is separate from the data. Right, I, I absolutely despise that. That's an awful thing. It makes it so hard to, to work with. Um, what's more, with the output parameter, I've got two separate lengths that are also separate from the data. So that's no fun. Um, this is C, so I'm already a little bit worried about what's going to happen when I implement this in terms of error handling. Right, so that's also going on in the back of my mind. And I think that that's all of the things that I came up with for now. But it takes me to my first principles. Number one, C is evil. And if you don't believe me, it's because it violates all of my other first principles, um, which starts with, we want abstractions. Um, so conventions are things that your, your carbon units uh, decide to do to try and make their lives a little bit easier, right? They, it, it's, I decide I want to do this to flag something. Uh, it, it's easy to forget. 
you may or may not actually do it in practice. But an abstraction is a strong, the compiler's going to yell at me when I make a mistake. So uh, because of the, this pile of poo that I'm waiting in as I'm implementing an ODBC driver is so bad, it's super important that I abstract all of that horrible stuff in the interface. Um, I want my stuff to be explicit and safe, uh, and I think that C in general is very unremarkable and subtle. Right? When I talk to people about C, they, they always say that they love it because it's just so simple and there, there's so few things you need to know, and I come back to them and I tell them, well, wait a second, we have libraries that people have been using for many, many years that have bugs in them that, that cause massive security uh, issues. And, Everything's just kind of awful. And then finally, one last thing that I kind of dealt with is my failures have to be sane. Things have to fail in predictable manners. There has to be a nice stack trace at least for me to look at. Um, and I, I want things to die effectively. So here's kind of what I ended up doing. So the first things first, there are some conventions. Number one is anything that comes in that's not safe gets prefixed with an underscore so that a red flag goes on in my head don't use this. And I think actually if I were to rewrite this, I would wrap this, uh, all of those underscore types in strong type defs that don't let you do anything with them other than make them safe. But more on that in a little bit when I talk about what's going on with the connection handle. Um, first thing that happened in the actual code, exception boundary goes up. And I love that that's like a simple thing that I can do in every single function that doesn't cost me anything. And then immediately everything goes to safety primitives. I got D strings, I've got uh, an output container that wraps stuff. And the equivalent C++ to make this all happen would just have kind of sucked. Um, it would be a lot less efficient. When I show you the implementation for 2D string, I think it might surprise some of you. Uh, and then I exploited one nifty thing here in the connection handle. You'll note that the void pointer goes away. And the reason I can do that is because connection handle is a black box to the C code. It's uh, driver, allocate this random thing, I'm going to tell you to do stuff with it and eventually free it, but the C code just passes it around, it shuffles it around. And so because I get to pick that type, when it links together, a class is just a pointer, and so ODBC connection is just a normal class, and it comes in safe, which I thought was awesome. Right? And that I definitely can't do in, in C++. So this blew my mind. Andre showed me this one-liner uh, kind of early on, which I take a C string and I take a slice of it and all of a sudden I've got myself a nice slice of characters that does exactly what I want it to. How cool is that? <laughs> One line and I've taken my data and my length and I've turned it, like put it together without copying anything. Not a single thing was copied uh, and it, it cost me one line. In practice, there, there's some fuzzy bits. You have to check if it's null. Uh, ODBC has some fun things where it likes to sometimes not tell you the length and give you a magic number that says, instead says it's null terminated. So fine, wrap it in a function once. Um, in hindsight, I think that this could have been done better, but I also wanted really badly to group together the two lengths for, for output parameters. So I, I don't like the idea that uh, truncation is something that has to be handled manually, and so I've got a function that's not shown that deals with that, and converting between uh, kind of characters versus bytes. But here I have three pieces of information. The data, the maximum length that bu my buffer can hold, and the actual number of bytes that are being stored. And my question to you is, where is that maximum length or maximum size of the buffer being stored? Just for kicks. Since I don't think it's super obvious. Yeah, so I heard it. it it's uh, part of the buffer. It's buffer.length. So that is just a slice of the incoming data. Um, and again, I just kind of love that this was simple to do, and then I can use it in a bunch of different places because of the alias this. All right, um, more challenges, more fun things going on in a DLL. I have to pass things back and forth to C. So out from the beginning, the garbage collector is just kind of not going to work because uh, you can't keep track of those references across the boundary, um, and in fact, if anyone's looking for some extra work to do, uh, the garbage collector is actually disabled because I ran out of time and didn't get a chance to fix this. But it's a fun problem because you can't even rely on the operating system to clean stuff up for you. Uh, with the DLL, the driver manager may keep your driver running long after the client stops using you. 
right? So you can't just say, oh, I'm gonna run for a short while and then leak all my bytes because who cares? It's actually something that needs to be dealt with. Uh, and especially when you're talking terabytes, petabytes of data, it's super fun that right now we actually are leaking all that data. Um, and as mentioned before, it goes back and forth in the magic black box. Um, so the, there was kind of an interesting property with these black boxes. For one thing, the, there's like eight of them. So uh, it's not just the connection handle, there's a statement handle and there's these descriptor things and, and they often, it, ODBC is designed so that they fit inside of each other. So one's a member of another, is a member of another, is a member of another, um, and then there's also some that are not like that. And it made for a very interesting uh, usage of with statements. And I remember Andre was telling me that like with statements were maybe going to be talked about for deprecation, and so I just kind of wanted to share with you all what that was. Um, and because there were these things that were required to be nested sometimes, but not all of the time, and you get like four of the handles in one function, and you needed to use all of the data members of all of them, having like with this and with this and with this and with this really just made the code a lot more readable. Um, so I, I don't have a great example to show you, but take my word on it, it, it was kind of helpful, whereas with a member function that only helps you if you only have to deal with one class, this works for n. Not going to talk too much about this, but I'm sad that this was not in the standard library. Maybe today, not sure, uh, but this is code for allocating things with malloc and free. So may not even be an optimal implementation, but I was kind of jarred by the fact that I have to use underscore underscore traits, which isn't really documented all that well, to get the size of a class, which is different than a struct, and then even once I have that, in place needs to be called two different ways to then shove it into the bytes that I've allocated. Um, I was actually relieved when, when cleanup, uh, the, the free function worked quite nicely. Interesting line. Um, we've got a mem set here, and that goes back to the, the issue of failing predictably, failing in a way that is sane. Uh, I had some interesting problems when working on this driver, which is that the handles would get deallocated because the C code would say, hey, I don't need this anymore, and would immediately reallocate the same bytes because why not, they, they were there, they were free, and start doing things that looked half right. right? And so adding that one little line of sanity checking there was just kind of an awesome thing uh, that I loved having in this code. All right, so there's some fun stuff, some, some things that you might enjoy. The first is debugging in a DLL. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of debuggers. Uh, I love my print statements, you'll, you'll never change me. Uh, and so how do you do that when you don't have a terminal window? Right, you, you can use a logger, but tail dash F isn't really all that great when you've got tons of things flying by. And there's not really a way to pause and, and stop the execution for those rare cases where you do want to attach a debugger. And lo and behold, in the depths of our stood.c.windows library, there's this function that puts up a pop-up box with a message and an OK button. Cheers. <laughs> Whoever ported that library, you have my gratitude. Um, and then there was just kind of an idea that I got from, I don't know if it was decon for cppcon this last year, but taking runtime information and converting it to compile time information is something that I've played with a lot, a couple times in this project and in a few others. And the reason for this is, the argument that was made is that the optimizer has had so many hundreds of man hours put into it uh, that if you want to make your code faster, really the best way to do that is to just shove everything that you possibly can at your compiler. Uh, and so, if you've got a variant lying around, uh, I, I suppose probably an algebraic would be more appropriate for this example, but you know that it can be only a certain number of types. Then D let me do this awesome switch on type that didn't actually involve any code duplication that said, hey, uh, get the type out, compare it against all these things, because there's just code generated at compile time to do it, and dispatch it off to a function that now knows exactly what type you're working with. So everything from this point onward in the code can now be optimized with type information, which I think is awesome and super cool. All right, this wouldn't be a talk at DConf without some uh, ranting about D. So number one, uh, I remember this was talked about last year, but 
when I did do a little bit of my dev on, on Linux, the stack traces I don't think have line numbers even today. And that just makes it so much harder to do everything. So I'm sad. I wanted to rant. Standard JSON is uh, kind of an interesting pothole in, in Phobos. Um, I think that there's been talk about making it better, but at the time I, I was writing this driver, it did not actually work on 64-bit on Windows. Um, I, I have since actually submitted a couple pull requests, which I was delighted was quite easy to do. That actually happened at Deconf last year. And uh, the reason it didn't work is because the real type does not work on 64-bit Windows. And somebody magically showed up with that answer in the bug tracker. So kudos on whoever that was. Um, and then there's just kind of a comment on a pervasive mess I've seen in the library, which is that nobody tests for const correctness. Right? Nobody has tests anywhere in Phobos really for this thing uh, works on something that is const, and if it came in mutable, it also comes out mutable, which I think is a shame. So I added some of that to JSON. Uh, D is too good for its own good, or specifically the D compiler. Uh, I wrote up a proper make file, being the good C++ person that I am, you know, separating out all your dependencies. And at some point I'm asking Andre for help, and he's like, why is this taking forever to, to compile? Comes over, changes, uh, or tells me to change my make file to just one line, compile all the things all at once. Order of magnitude speed up, which is kind of at the same time, wonderful and impressive and also really jarring to somebody who's coming from a different background. And I don't know if we can highlight this to our newcomers, uh, but I thought that this was cool and worth mentioning. Um, I'm told that it has something to do with the caching that DMD does with, with imports when you have everything available all at once. So I've had some like, fun experiences with dub. <laughs> Uh, and in particular, I remember having an extremely difficult time pulling in a GUI library. Right? I, it was like I, I download go, dub, I had to make a dub package for my driver even though I had no intention of putting it on dub. Uh, and then how do I make things import correctly even though the directories don't match up the right way. And I don't actually remember if I ended up solving this, but at some point I figured out that there was a like. SDK or something that was a .lib file that I had to link with that didn't work on Windows DLLs because of shoddy support. So dub went out the window and we ended up with the best GUI ever. Wait for it. <laughs> notepad. <laughs> Create a temp file, start up notepad, read whatever they saved. Wow. Best thing ever. All right, so I wanted to talk about an anti-pattern that I came up with as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, the team I'm on right now at Facebook is, uh, is FB Code Foundation, and we're kind of the janitors of the C++ developer experience. Uh, and what that includes is kind of tracking down flaky tests is one of the things that my team and related teams work on. And so it was important to me that I wrote good solid tests for this that didn't actually have any network calls that were repeatable and verifiable and did all the lovely mocking stuff that you would expect in other languages. And I thought, wait a second, I can get best of both worlds. I can do this without making my code ugly by passing every single dependency in from the top if I just use version unit test everywhere. So two versions of, of curl, uh, one version that has this thread local variable at the top that is used for when you actually want to you know, get your fake output out, and a version that just says, forward these symbols along like a good person, because it, thankfully it is not the default that you do that, but you can. The problem is kind of twofold. There, there's a not compelling argument, which is, what if I want to have both the mocked version and the not mocked version available in the same binary? And, and one example of that would be, Suppose I wanted a tests binary. It first does the unit test blocks and then starts main and does some integration tests. Flaky. The real issue, and maybe this is a bug, somebody could, could correct me, but I had unit tests uh, using this mock in the actual file that wrote this, but also in another file. And halfway through one of the tests in, in one of the files, another test in the other file would start running, touch my thread local thing, and then everything would assert because the state was not consistent. 
So this does not work because we are too parallel when we run our tests. Go figure. We get some proper mocking. I know Walter likes pictures. <laughs> um, and that's going to look something more like this. So I take a class. The class just wraps the call for the actual version. And now my data member is where I actually store my fake results. And you can use it kind of like this. It, it's the same sort of ugly pass it in from the top like you get in every other language. But it works just as well in D. So a little disappointed. Um, it would be awesome if I could do mocking with just like a, a version statement. Uh, maybe somebody has a way to do that. I'd love to hear about it. All right. So uh, this is the part where I'm kind of done talking about the driver and things that happened in that. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how I've been using D lately at my job, which is to corral C++ and C++ programmers. Uh, and so one of the first things that I did is I, I wrote, uh, we don't use make files, but we use something quite similar that uh, consists of arbitrary Python, but usually in a predictable manner. And I used D to write something that lets you refactor that, including all the comments, and uh, surprisingly worked out 99% of the time with just regex. So yay trying to interpret Python with regexes. But there's some fun functions you come up with on the way, and I, I thought I'd share them. So, and, and general things. So I, I love D for scripting. Um, whoever decided to add a shebang notation in RDMD, you are my favorite person, um, because this is my favorite scripting language. Uh, it is blazing fast. I love the fact that, you know, in Bash you can separate functions out and reuse them, but you, you don't unit test your Bash. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got, you know, three files that get included from 12 different scripts, and they're all well-tested and bulletproof because of this, and I love it. Um, standard process is wonderful, whoever wrote that. Uh, I know that we overhauled it maybe a couple years ago. Thank you as well. One of my favorite things that I did, though, was I added a layer of caching on top. Uh, and the reason for this, for example, is I've got one function that goes through mercurial history and gives you a bunch of data. And mercurial history can be slow sometimes, just like git history. It, it can take 10 seconds, 20 seconds, sometimes more. And sometimes I, my output is, here's a sum of the data that I got, but run with dash dash verbose if you wanted all of the data, which you probably don't, but maybe you do. And I don't want you to wait another 30 seconds to get that result. Right? So I cache the, the call to log. And if you want to rerun with dash dash verbose, it's there for you immediately. So I love this. I've been using it basically everywhere um, because usually there, there's some sort of eviction time that you're okay with for anything that you would possibly run on a bash command, whether it's five minutes or five days or a year. And so that's kind of fun. Um, can't fit the whole implementation on the slide, but I, the idea I thought was worth sharing. Um, one complaint about standard process is that my version gives the output as a file and standard process gives the output as a string, which may be gigantic. So, sad face. All right. Um, I also loved caching this way. This was a pattern that, I, that, that I've come to love uh, for uh, especially things like system calls, where I know that they're going to be basically the same for as long as my program's running and don't want to have that cost of doing it again. So if, I'll show an example of that in a moment, but the idea is pull in standard functional, have a nested static function, memoize it, and only show to the user the memoized version so that they can't do the inefficient thing. And so one example is I memoize call to exists, I memoize loops, and I thought that this was just kind of a lovely thing that gave me an, a really nice speed boost. Uh, the last couple of presenters have kind of beat me to the punch, but I love programs that kind of flow. The, the bottom bit where it's A dot B dot C dot E. And notably, kind of everyone's been talking about this since C++ 98, I remember. It's like Scott Myers' books is always use the standard algorithms. They're going to be more awesome because it's self-documenting and faster. And the difference between C++ 98 and even 11, if, when, when you get lambdas, which make it somewhat bearable, is that there is nothing out there that I've seen that is anywhere near as clean as this. I think that this is beautiful. At the very least, the bottom bit, the function is a little, yeah. Uh, but I no longer write loops in my code. I consider myself having made a mistake when I have a loop now, because I'd rather read it as a set of instructions. It's like, first do this, then do that, then do that, because it's so much more readable, and the white space is kind of beautiful and lovely. And 
Uh, this is actually a 15 line program that I wrote recently to deduplicate uh, things that you pipe into it, basically. Have fun. Um, oh, and one algorithm that I kind of think we should have, um, although the new standard algorithm each might deprecate this with a no op function passed to it. All it does is say, be greedy, right? De do the actual work, don't just let it sit there. Um, this is useful for when you have maps that do things like right line that don't actually return anything, so you can't call dot array, but that you want to have eagerly executed. So, useful thing. Um, nifty thing comes up is, how do you debug in this style, right? Because I'm a fan of print instrumentation, as we've been over, and is there a bug in my first little thing in my, my pipeline or my second? Is an interesting question to ask or to answer without, you know, adding a variable, breaking it up, and saying, all right, print something and keep going. And so, um, the solution I came up with is a function that just, you insert it in your pipeline and everything keeps going and it prints stuff out. Um, and the wonderful thing is you can kind of kill the line and paste it somewhere else and it's just going to continue working for you. And so I've got an implementation. Uh, thank you to the last speaker because I, I now use dot save so that it works. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so for if it's a forward range or better, it'll call dot save. If it's an input range, then I convert it to an array, which I suppose if it's an infinite range could be super fun. Yes. Have you run into the problem that uh, you know, if you map something with a right line, that uh, that right line is happening in the fr the front method of map, and then various other algorithms down the chain could call front multiple times in ways that you might not necessarily expect. So you can end up with seeing more logging than you would expect. Uh, Doesn't necessarily get called once per element, is what I mean. Right. Uh, that is very interesting. I had not considered that. Um, usually, though, when I when I have a map like that, the the thing I'm doing at the end is just print it all out. In fact, I haven't used it for anything else. So debug range is one of my new favorite things. Um, and then an identity debug things like print a message and keep going uh, for just normal print things is also a lovely thing to have. Um, I kind of came up with one last complaint as well during that last talk, which uh, Andre, you gave a talk not too long ago, which was about uh, turtles all the way down in D. And I'm wondering where my turtles are. Because if I do 0 dot dot 10 anywhere other than a for each loop, it does not do anything at all. And I'd love to be able to just say, hey, here's my flow style, 0 to 10, let's, let's go print those things out or iterate over them. And, and I know that there's now IOTA, uh, but it'd be lovely to have this. Yes? <laughs> uh, just to, to say that's a typo, dot dot in that context is spelled IOTA. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, we've hit the end. Um, so the, basically what I wanted to share with you all is that D is really, really kind of awesome for dealing with smell, right? So I had all of the, this smelly, horrible, nasty interface from ODBC, and it was just so much nicer to work with when I was able to build strong abstractions that, that kept all of my associated things like data and length together uh, with safe operations only. And it was just kind of wonderful and let me do things that C++ would not, uh, or at the very least that C++ would not let me do without oodles and oodles more code. So props to D for that. Um, there are some things that didn't quite work right, especially since I was on Windows 64-bit with DLLs. Uh, I was unable to make the equivalent of DLLs on OS X work, so, so that is still fun. Uh, and also, D is just kind of awesome for, for everyday scripting that lets you do things like clean up other code. So, stuff. All right, we have time for questions. Walter. Uh, you were stomping on your data when you freed it with uh, zero? 
Yes, uh, that, that's apparently. a great idea. But it turns out that zero often is a valid value for data. So I like to stomp things with like uh, BE or something like that. And also that when it shows up in the debugger that your data has the contents BE, you know that you're accessing something that you've already freed. Interesting. I like that idea. Um, this definitely made it more obvious when things went wrong, but I, I imagine BE might be even better. All right. So we had uh, the last talk of the talk of the day. Let's thank Mark.